thanks. I would like to thank uh, Councilman Ikor and uh, uh, Pearl Smith, your media chair, for allowing us to come and talk to you. Uh, not that uh, benefits or health care is, uh, is something that you're worried about, that there's been any changes in uh, that have affected you at all. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, American health care, which I don't think it's an exaggeration to say it's in crisis, and you guys know that from your own experience. Uh, there are problems with cost and access. Uh, our current system, why doesn't it work better? And then what we believe is a solution, which is a single-payer system or Medicare for all. So first of all, um, I, we, uh, other people have given these talks and uh, realized at the end of the talk that no one really understood what the term single payer is. So, uh, whoopsie, uh, boy. that's what happens when you allow people who are technologically incompetent to start running equipment. Anyway, so what is single payer? So it's what we don't have. This is our current system as far as the funding is concerned. We've got all the people in the U.S., us. Okay, over on the left, we have people, you pay them money and then they pay the people on the right. Hospitals, doctors, pharmacies, nursing homes, nurses, whatever. Okay, so those are the providers of care. We are the consumers of care. We are the patients. Payers are all these things in the middle. And as you can see, in the United States, there are an awful lot of them. Each one with its own bureaucracy, each one with its own procedures, each one with its own requirements. It's very complex. In fact, it's worse than this because we have so many different payers, it divides us into lots of different groups. Maybe there are veterans who go to the VA medical center. Maybe there are people who have a, you know, an employer plan through their, a health plan through their employer. Maybe there are people who are self-insured. And maybe there is a group of four uh, people, retired public employees who have their own health care plan. The problem with having so many different groups is now our interests are not all aligned with each other, are they? No. So let's take an example as to how that can work against this. So we'll take the VA system. VA is a little different because it's a payer, it's a government program, it's also a provider. And it serves a specific group of people, veterans. Well, I don't know if you remember, a few years ago, as soldiers began returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, Congress made them a promise you're all going to be seen within two weeks of returning to the United States by a doctor at the VA system. And it came to light a few months later, the VAs all over the nation were lying. They were just saying, oh, no, it's two weeks definitely. But what they were doing is they were throwing people off the system and immediately putting them back in to make it look like the wait times were shorter. Why was that happening? Well, because Congress made this promise, but... In order to carry that out, they needed to hire more doctors, more nurses, more nurse practitioners. They did not, because that requires money. And for Congress to spend money, they have to raise taxes. So what we had was a VA system which worked perfectly well, but was being deliberately un underfunded because it only, it only serves one specific group of people. And all these other people were about to have their taxes raised. And Congress doesn't like to raise taxes on their constituents. So this is a system which divides us, it divides the payers, and it's tremendously expensive, and it doesn't work very well. So what is the solution to this? This is, this is a solution. This is a good solution. We know it's a good solution because just about every other industrialized country on Earth does this. We have one group of patients again, which is everybody, the entire population of the country. We have one single payer, Medicare, Medicare for all. The government is the payer. The government administers Medicare. You're already paying for it. You've been paying for it all your life. And in turn, everybody who provides care, hospitals, doctors, pharmacies, all these providers have one insurance company to deal with. This works out very well. Canadian doctors, when they do billing, they spend one quarter the amount of money that American doctors do to recover costs. It's a very efficient system. So when we say a single payer system, this is what we're talking about. There's only one entity that pays providers, and that would be Medicare. Everybody is on Medicare. Now, one of the nice things about this is this group here. Everybody in this room would be in this group. And critically, a couple of other people would be in this group as well. These guys would be in this group. <laughs> They're in the group. Now they have the same insurance you do. And most importantly, maybe, this guy does. 
He has the same insurance under a single payer system that you do. When was the last time that those guys cut their own benefits? Never. <laughs> when, so when, when did they compromise the amount of health care they got? When did they try to underfund their own health care? In the bill that Congress passed, the House passed this spring, there was a stipulation in the bill that the Congressional Health Care Plan was exempt from the conditions of that bill. They knew what a bad bill it was, and they knew what a good deal they had. Well, we need their deal, and that's what single-payer does. So this is why we've been yelling and screaming about health insurance reform for the last God knows how many years now. Between 1976 and 2010, the eve of the ACA, Obamacare, if you want to call it that, being enacted, the number of uninsured Americans rose from about 20 million all the way up to about 50 million. After the ACA, the number dropped to about 26 million. Well, unfortunately, in the interim, in the first quarter of 2017, the number has started to rise again. We now have 2 million more Americans now without insurance than, were, than had insurance at the beginning of 2017. Mm -hmm. And there's reasons for that. We'll get into that. But this is a problem. We spend way too much money. This is the amount the United States <coughs> government spends on health care. You can see it's already more than any other country does. But when you add all the out-of-pocket costs, the copays, the deductibles, the caps on benefits, we actually wind up spending roughly twice what any other country does on our health health care, despite having that 28 million people uninsured. This is why people are starting to become uninsured again. This is why, even with the Affordable Care Act in place, we're starting to see an increase in the number of people uninsured. This little blue line down at the bottom is the rate of inflation between 1999 and 2008. Just above it in green is the average wage uh, in, in this country. As you can see, it barely keeps pace with inflation. But this big red line, this is the average rate of rise of a health insurance premium. On average, 5% per year. This is a problem because this number, even under the ACA, shows no signs of slowing down. And if you believe the Congressional Budget Office, that entity that Republicans keep trying to uh, ignore and not have comment on their health care plans, by 2025, this number is going to equal roughly 50% of the average person's wage. The average family of four will be spending half their income, theoretically, on their health care. By 2032, it will be all for their income. That won't work. Oops, I'm doing this again. Where's the money going? Are we, do we have too many doctors, too many hospitals? Uh, well, between 1970 and 2007, uh, the number of physicians in this country rose less than 2%. The person who made this slide said they only made it that thick so it would show up. But during that same period of time, this group got a lot bigger. These are the people who actually do the pro paper processing. These are the administrative personnel. They've grown 3,000%. In the same time where we barely added any physicians at all. So we know where the expense in our healthcare system is going. It's going to administrative waste and some other things. So in addition to people who are uninsured, there are people now who are underinsured. And they define that as people who have to spend less about 10% of their income on their health care. As you can see, the number of people with no insurance spending 10% has risen. That's a thicker bar than this one is. But the people who have insurance, that's the light purple, there are way more of them now who are spending 10% of their income or more than were a few years ago. So the number, the amount of uninsurance and underinsurance has gone up. This has, con this has financial con uh, consequences. In 2009, 62% of people who were declaring personal bankruptcy were doing so because of their health care costs. And of those people, 75% had insurance at the onset of the illness or injury that bankrupted them. Why can that happen? Well, we already mentioned some of the reasons. Co-payments, deductibles, caps and benefits. But a lot of people have insurance tied to their employment. And if you get cancer, you break both legs. Sometimes you lose your job. And when you lose your job, sometimes you lose your health care benefits. Now who pays for the bills? You do. This has consequences on how people use the system. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but I'm just saying, these, this bar is what happens to people when they get crushing chest pain in the middle of the night. You've got insurance, you call the ambulance. If you have bad insurance, where you know you're going to be paying significant amounts of money for your care, 
you delay up to 20% longer before you call the ambulance. If you have no insurance, it's almost up to 40% longer. This is a disease. People who delay seeking medical treatment for serious conditions die more than they should. And it's hard to get at this number because when the doctor fills out the death certificate, he doesn't write no insurance. He writes heart attack, pneumonia, sepsis, whatever. But best estimates, conservative <coughs> estimates, put this number at 1 to 1,000 per year. So if you have no insurance, you have a 1 out of 1,000 chance of dying this year. 28 million uninsured, 28,000 Americans are going to die this year because we can't figure out how to fix this system. It's a lot of people. Just to give you a, one of the particularly grim factoids, this is maternal mortality in a number of different countries. All of these countries have some form of single-payer national health insurance. Our rate of women dying while giving birth is eight times that of Australia. The country that uh, our president said a few months ago, I think they've got a very good health care system. He doesn't know what kind of health care system they have, but he knows it's very good. And strangely enough, in this case, he's actually right. Okay. So what's another cause, cause of too much expense in the system? Well, pharmaceutical costs. Pharma, the pharmacy industry, Big Pharma, always says it's, it's our R&D. We're having to spend so much money developing new drugs. Well, sometimes they do spend money developing new drugs. Sometimes they don't. I don't know if anybody's heard about Harvoni. It's very heavily advertised now. There is a disease called chronic hepatitis C. It affects millions of people. It's lethal. kills people. Well, this is the first time a drug has ever been shown or developed that actually cures this disease. We have a cure now. It unfortunately was developed at Drexel University by a researcher who had an NIH grant but absolutely no morals whatsoever because he didn't tell any people, anybody what he'd found. He left the university, founded his own little pharmaceutical company, Gilead Pharmaceuticals, a private pharmaceutical firm, bought him out for $440 million, promptly got the patent on the drug, and now this drug that costs pennies to make is, going to, is retailing at $95,000 for a course to save your life. Really, it stands to make more than $300 billion over the next few years from this drug. You know, if somebody says, pay me $90,000, I'm going to kill you, that's extortion, isn't it? That's what's going on. In my opinion, the pharmaceutical industry in the United States is the largest legalized extortion racket on the planet. Colchicine, this is an ancient drug. It comes from a, from a bark of uh, some kind of tree. Anyway. Uh, it's been known for centuries. Takeda Pharmaceuticals did a very unnecessary study showing what everyone knew. It worked for gout. Used to be six cents a pill, now it's six dollars a pill. They got a patent. EpiPen, we all heard about that one, right? Mm -hmm. Myelin had such market dominance, they said, you know what? Let's just jack the price up 400%. And they did. No one stopped them. So, our healthcare system is too expensive, kills people, and doesn't deliver care very effectively. I left out a bunch of slides. Our life expectancy is now, I think, somewhere down in the 20s, you know, as far as 20th, uh, 29th, I think, in the world. Um, we have a lower life expectancy than every other country that has single-payer national health insurance. And in this country, a child born to poor parents is going to live 15 years fewer than a child born to rich parents. First time in this country's history, certainly in the last century, where that's been true. So the, the system is not working. Half of Rhode Island's hospitals have either been sold to out-of-state entities or about to be. Memorial in Pawtucket's closing. The state's largest health insurer, Blue Cross, lost money in three of the last five years. Congressional Budget Office, I already mentioned this, that prices are becoming rapidly more and more unaffordable. But I will not stop doing that long. There we go. So, Medicare for all. What's so great about Medicare? Well, it means freedom of choice. Now, the big argument that conservatives use about Medicare for about a single parent national health insurance, it takes away your choice. Does anyone in this room seriously care who is your insurance company? No. <laughs> Nobody does. Who cares about that? Insurance companies do. They're the only ones who do. You don't. So what you care is, do you like your doctor? Do you think he's competent or she is competent? Where do you go for a hospital? You know, that's what you care about. So there's almost 700,000 doctors practicing in the United States. Oops. Oh boy. That didn't work, did it? Okay, here we go. I went backwards. Okay, there's the number of doctors. Here's the number of doctors who don't take Medicare. These are people like plastic surgeons who do stuff that Medicare doesn't pay for anyway. That means Medicare's network, so you have to go in network, right? 
Well, 98% of the doctors in this country are in Medicare's network. And if, network, and if Medicare were the only game in town, if there were no other insurance options, I'm sure that number would be 100%. So as far as limiting your choice, Medicare actually increases your choice. You have a weird condition with your head. And your orthopedic surgeon at Rhode Island Hospital says, you know what, I could do this, but the guy who's really great at this is a Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland. Is Blue Cross going to pay for you to go out of state? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Our Medicare does. Medicare for all. If they're a network and they're getting paid the same thing as the guy in your state, Medicare, a national health insurance program, doesn't care where you go as long as you go in, within the United States. So you can go to any doctor you want. So, <clears throat> Medicare means you waste, you waste less money in bureaucracy. This is the internal overhead for a number of the largest private health insurance companies, up to about 20%. That's just the overhead within the company. We're not even talking about the amount of paperwork they cause hospitals and doctors and a bunch of other people to do. Medicare, 1.4% overhead. Remember back in 2004, Mr. Bush said, okay, we're going to pass a bill that is going to pay for your prescriptions, Medicare Part D. Now, he could have just said, all right, great, let's just expand Medicare. Let's just fund it better so we can pay for prescriptions. Instead, he would said, okay, well, no, we don't like federal programs, so we're going to ask a bunch of private insurance companies to come in and run Medicare Part B. So when you go to Medicare Part D, you have to get a private insurance plan, Medicare Coinsurance. Well, even these plans that are heavily regulated, their overhead is three times what traditional Medicare spends. They're inefficient. They always are. What's the red block? The red block... These are the Medicare Part D program. This is the amount of overhead that's being billed to Medicare that's being generated directly by Blue Chip, by United Healthcare's Medicare Part D program, by all the private health insurers that participate in the Medicare Advantage. Boy, what a misnomer that is. So they love the Medicare Advantage. They are paid so well by Medicare Advantage. Uh, to Humana and, and United Healthcare. We're both threatening, in fact, Humana already has, to pull out of the Obamacare single or individual market. None of them are pulling out of Medicare Advantage. You know, it's, it's like it's very difficult to pull, pull a pig away from when it's got its nose in the trot. It's, it's, it's going to keep that nose in there. So, okay, so Medicare means healthier Americans. This is, I find this a very interesting slide when it appears. So this is... Americans rank by uh, their age, so 0 to 1, 1 to 4 years of age, 5 to 9, 55, 59. Uh, keep your eye on this area here, because this is when we turn 65. So these are people in five-year intervals. And this is what happens to our life expectancy compared to people in other countries. So men and women, up to the age of 65, uh, this is an old slide, because we aren't even at age 17. We're not even 17 anymore. We're down to the 20s. But as you can see, we rank at, behind at least 17 other countries. If you're a 20-year-old in America, you are, uh, there are 16 other countries where 20-year-olds are likely to live longer than you do. All the way up to age 65. What happens at age 65? Age 60, this is what happens. Wow. At age 65, all of a sudden, Americans start getting very healthy. At age 65, our life expectancies, compared to other countries, rise. By the time we hit our 90s, by the time we're 95 years old, you know, I'm surprised the Germans and the Japanese aren't coming over here to spend the last five years of their life, because they're likely to live longer. Well, what happens at age 65? Medicare. Now you don't have to worry about the hospital bills as much. Now you don't have to worry, well, you still have to worry about pharmaceuticals. But you have access to care. And we know when we, when price, when cost is taken out of the, equi out of the, out of the equation, Americans know how to get care for their illnesses. They know where to go. It's just that up till age 65, the price is holding them back. 95, and we're living as long as the rest of the world. Think of all the people who died in this area, who shouldn't have. Think of all the lives lost. Medicare for all makes economic sense. 25 independent studies, there's probably more on that by now. Savings would fund full coverage. So my group, Physicians for a National Health Program, did a study back in 2003 and then updated it uh, 10 years, 12 years later. And their estimate is if we just went from our current multi-payer system with all those people in the middle, to a single-payer Medicare for all, we would be saving off without increasing coverage 
we'd be saving $500 billion annually, which would be more than enough to provide care for the remaining 28 million people who need care. So every other study where there wasn't a, uh, uh, the, the, everybody, the concerns like a, <coughs> quote, a, uh, a, a place called the Urban Institute, which published a study during the heat of the Democratic primary last year, that, oh no, it's going to add all sorts of extra expense. Well, unfortunately, the Urban Institute had a dog in that fight, and her name was Hillary Clinton. So they made a lot of assumptions, like we couldn't achieve the same savings that the Canadians did on bureaucracy. We couldn't achieve the same savings on pharmaceuticals as Canada did. They made a lot of assumptions, which basically have to assume that we're either more corrupt or more stupid in Canada, or both. And yeah, if you make those assumptions, it doesn't look so good. But if you think we can do as well as Canadians can, we can pay for this program. So, I'm not going to go through this, but basically there's a bunch of new costs. Part of it is uh, uh, all the people added. Uh, we have to pay doctors and hospitals more because Medicaid doesn't pay as much as Medicare does. That costs extra money. We have to have a lot of uninsured. That's going to add extra money. And then you can presume there's going to be some increased utilization because people can go to the doctor, now they can go to the farm, they can pick up their prescriptions, etc., etc. But if you then weigh that against the reduction in government administration, $23 billion, Health Insurance Administration, this is all the crap that goes on because of the insurance industry. give you an example. Massachusetts General Hospital, people have heard of that? Yep. So that's a great big, probably the you know, most famous uh, teaching hospital in the United States. They have 350 people doing their billing, trying to recover claims, costs, etc. There's a similar sized hospital, Toronto General, in Toronto, Canada, about the same size, about the same number of people uh, seen every year. How many billers do you think they have? Two. Six. Very close. Three. <laughs> Three. So when we say health administration is going to go down, yeah, yeah, it, because in Canada it did. Administrative cost to providers. So this is all the money that the hospitals and the doctors and the pharmacies and the nurses and the VNAs, you know, VNA brought out, went out of business, well, I was, well, you know, it's expensive to do business in our system. Increased market power. This is all the savings you could achieve making the insurance, making the pharmaceutical companies charge fair prices. Uh, I have a friend who has asthma, who gets, used to get their uh, in after inhaler from CDS, and uh, I think CDS wanted without insurance $180. My friend had a very smart wife who actually got online, and now I'm getting, now uh, my friend is getting uh, that inhaler for $20 wow. from Canada. Which I don't think is legal, but so I, I haven't told my friend that. Okay, so are there bills to achieve this? There are. They've been sitting in Congress for years, not voted on. So the first one was by this guy, John Klein, is in Michigan, HR 676. Uh, it, I had to alter this slide because we now have 120 co-sponsors, including miraculously both the Rhode Island's congressmen, Mr. Cicilline and Mr. Langevin, have both signed on as sponsors. Mr. Cicilline back in April for the first time, although we've been nagging him to do this for five years. And Mr. Langevin, who swore to God three months ago he would never do this, and boom, he's there. And I think politicians have a really uh, great way of decision making, a very logical, rational way, and it's this. <laughs> so, oops. And then this guy has a bill that he's been introducing, reintroduced, uh, S18, Senate Bill 1804. Uh, it pretty much is a Medicare for All bill. Now, 16 co sponsors, including our own Senator Whitehouse who actually was one of the original co-sponsors when this bill was reintroduced this summer. We are chatting with Senator Reid, who says he's for the idea, but isn't the sponsor yet. So if any of you are close personal friends of Jack Reed, next time you invite him over a cup of coffee, get him in a headlock, or no, just to <laughs> try to convince him that this is something we need to do. So we are actually are sponsoring single-payer in legislation in this state, in Rhode Island. So there's a House bill, this was the number last season, we have to reintroduce it in the coming legislative session, but it was H5-069, it had several sponsors, Senate Bill S1504, I have to say, Aaron Regenberg and Jeanine Calkin have really done a bad for us, they've done a really great job in sort of publicizing this bill within you know, our legislature, in helping to shepherd it through, and of course, in Rhode Island, in Rhode Island if they don't like your bill, uh, there is a, a death sentence, which is called held for further study. So every time we've introduced this bill, it's always held for further study. So this year, we've actually, if they're not going to pass it, which we'll see, um, we'd like to hold it for further study and actually study it this time. We actually already studied it. 
Gerald Friedman is the, who was the chair of the economics <coughs> department at UMass Amherst, I think he's uh, not the chair at this point, um, to, who also did the analysis for Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, actually did a financial study for us two years ago. So if we do get a study commission, we'll have to update it. But uh, anyway, uh, he shows what he says. This is routine. I do this all the time. It works in every state that's, that has considered it. And financially, it works. So if you want to actually look at his analysis, it's on single pair RI. It's on all, also on RhodeIslandHealthcare.org, right? Yes. Yeah, and it's uh, you can also get a lot of other good information at the uh, at my group's website, PNHP.org, and PNHP.org backslash RI. So I'm not going to go through this stuff. Basically, what uh, what Jerry's saying is we'd save a lot of money. Uh, one thing I do want to quickly point out is. Right now, the way we fund healthcare is regressive. So if you're Mitt Romney, you spend the same, you are charged premium for your insurance. Well, so is his secretary. And it's the same amount. And I think Mitt Romney makes slightly more money than his secretary does. So we have a very regressive way of funding our healthcare. Everyone pays the same premium. Unless you can't afford a good plan, in which case you pay less. But of course you get a lot less too. So with the way we'd be funding RICHIP, which would be, uh, this is the round, comprehensive health insurance plan, uh, would be with a combination of payroll taxes and uh, taxes on uh, capital gains, uh, dividends, uh, and uh, interest. Um, as you can see, the savings accrue all the way up to people making $163,000. People making $163,000 or less, their health care bills actually go down. People making more their health care bills go up. But if you're making $500,000 a year, I think you can afford it. <laughs> so why Rhode Island? Why are we doing this at all? Well, partially to increase awareness of this issue, to try to get people to talk about it, and God forbid we actually get it done in Rhode Island. Well, why Rhode Island? Canada's path to health care reform. This is how Canada did it. They didn't just suddenly wake up one day and say, you know, uh, it doesn't like, make any sense, eh, that we fund our health care system this way. So, you know, uh, we'll, uh, we'll just start doing like uh, the whole country, eh? So, yeah, okay, give me another Molson. So, they didn't do it that way. So, in 1962, a guy named Tommy Douglas, who actually in a recent poll was named Canada's the greatest Canadian. So, he was the provincial governor of Saskatchewan, and I don't even know where that is, introduced universal government finance health insurance for all one million residents. Roughly the same number of people as in the state of Rhode Island, except that Saskatchewan is this big, huge tundra that's like thousands of miles long. So implementing it would be a little more problematic, I would think. My, it did so well that by 1968, uh, the Canadian federal government said, okay, we've got to start doing the paperwork to roll this out nationwide. And it became law nationwide in Canada in 1972. Does it work? Canadians spend, hospitals spend one third on billing compared to the U.S. Canadian physicians spend one quarter on billing compared to the U.S. Canada re spends roughly half of their uh, half the money we do on per capita health care. And contrary to what Fox News keeps telling you, Canadians do not come to the U.S. for health care. That's been seen in a number of different studies. Why should they? They come here, they are bankrupted. They, you know, Canadian, the Canadian Medicare will not pay for them to get their elective hip operation here in the U.S. The only Canadians who come here are Canadians who want to go not to, you know, Joe Schmo down the street, me. They want to go to a world-famous hip expert at Mass General or at UCSF or one of those other places. By most health care outcome measures, Canadians get better care than we do. So if you have heart failure, you are in the hospital less in Canada because you get better access to drugs, better access to doctors. You don't get, you don't go to failures often. No Canadian is bankrupted by health care costs. It's all covered. And no Canadian dies due to lack of, lack, lack of access to health care. So, since 1972, how many major reforms have the Canadians had to make for their health care system? None. During that time, we've had the, uh, let's see, the Nixon employer covered mandate. We had the Clinton's abortive attempt at the, whatever that was that they tried to pass. We had Medicare Advantage. We had the Affordable Care Act. And then we had this abomination for the House passed. Uh, this uh, last April, which thank God won't be enacted into law. So we have had multiple attempts at fixing our healthcare system over the same period of time where the Canadians have had no change, have, had to make no changes at all. So, conclusion, uh, and concluding, a system that's based on private, multiple private health insurance plans will not lead to universal coverage. We've seen that under the ACA. Even with subsidies, they can't insure everybody because there are some people that are too unprofitable to insure. It will not create affordable insurance. 
Even under the ACA, two million more uninsured this year. The costs keep going up. Medicare for all can lead to universal comprehensive country coverage without costing more, and we know that because it works in every country that's doing it. It has the greatest potential to increase choice. You saw the slide. If there's only one insurance plan, well, if I'm Dr. You know, Dr. Ryan is not going to get paid if he doesn't accept Medicare. So he'd better move to another country. Uh, it can be financed fairly, as opposed to the way we're financing it now, which is extremely unfair. What can what can we do to get this hat to get this happen? Well, you know, facetiously you mentioned you happen to know Jack Reed. Uh, in addition to trying to convince him, as far as the state bill is concerned, when it's reintroduced, I think it's a good place to start. If your state senator or rep is not on the list, and it'll be on the website, right? So it'll be RhodeIslandHealthCare.org. You can check that website, and it'll list all the Rhode Island state senators, all the Rhode Island state legislators who are sponsoring uh, the single payer bill. So talk to your rep, talk to your senator, send them letters, show up their events, uh, call them, uh, organize informational events like this one in your town, invite people to speak, uh, write letters, op-eds to the paper, social media. Uh, do interviews on radio or TV. TV's becoming kind of a problem now because we've got Sinclair Media, we've got Fox, and they don't kind of like this kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, um, as I mentioned before, the websites have a lot of good information. Thank you. Thank you. Really good.